Hello, I'm Michael Parker, and welcome to Antidote. In our continuing quest to bring you the most interesting people of the 21st century, it gives me great pleasure to bring to you today a man who's been compared to uh, Timothy Leary, Hunter S. Thompson. He's a psychedelic pioneer. He's even been called the Forrest Gump of LSD, but he's so much more than that. He is a photographer, he is an orator, he is an actor, he is a reggae historian par excellence. And if that ain't enough, this man is so cool that Keith Richards comes to his house. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to have in the studio with me today, Roger Steppens. <laughs> Michael, thank you so much. <laughs> Roger, welcome to Antidote. <laughs> you know, that introduction reminds me of what Timothy Leary said about Los Angeles. He said, L.A. is where the migrants and the mutants and the future people come, the end point of terrestrial migration. <laughs> I've got to think about that for a minute. The end point, is that a good thing or a bad well, thing? Well, I mean, from here, it's outer space, and that's where they sent some of his ashes. So he was prophetic. They did, as a matter of fact. Yeah. And you know what? At the end, Leary was very much into technology. Oh, yeah. Like that was yeah. the new psychedelic. Yeah, he turned me on to cyberpunk back when I had him on my radio show on KCRW. I did a William show called Gibson Sound of the guys. 60s. Yeah, and uh, the first book uh, uh, had just come out, uh, Neuromancer, yes, the I've trilogy. Read it, yeah. And uh, he, he said, that's uh, all I'm reading these days is cyberpunk. So. Well, you have led, I mean, listen, I, I love doing this job because I get to introduce, my, I get to meet a lot of interesting people. And when I've been prepping for the show, reading about you, holy crap. <laughs> wow. I mean, you started out in Brooklyn, mm. Irish Catholic kid. Yeah. Uh, Goldwater conservative. Voted for Goldwater in '64. God help me. <laughs> hey man, it's, it's okay. I, you know what? Uh, um, I kind of understand that. But then things have just gone completely different. So, ladies and gentlemen, we got a lot to talk about. We're going to jump around here. Um, Roger has an art show this week at the Museum of Neon Art in Glendale that we're going to be talking about. But just recently, in the past year, I mean, you. I don't like this term so much because I like to think of one long act, but if there's a third act, you've certainly got one. You have this book. It's called The Family Acid. And I only recently found out about you, and I'm so glad I did. This book is a compilation of photographs of yours that has been put together by your daughter and your son. So now a lot of museums and a lot of galleries are on board with this incredible work that you're doing this art show that's going to happen this week you're, we're going to see some of your neon work but how did your relationship with the camera start because we've got so much ground to cover but how why did you get so infatuated with the camera and doing that i'm a frustrated artist and i have no talent i can't I draw a, well i can't draw a straight line and I, I, I grew up in museums in New York. My parents took me to the Met when I was five, six years old. And I, I, I know what great art looks like. And I wanted to try to create some. And every time I picked up a paintbrush or something, it was just a disaster. So um, I, I bought a camera when I arrived in Saigon in November of 1967. I realized that I was part of something that was historic. And so I bought a little Canon FT in the Cholon PX in Saigon for a hundred bucks and I started shooting. And three months later, the Tet Offensive broke out and there were 52 families living in huge sewer pipes on the street in front of my barracks. And there were people starving to death every day in, in this. And, and I wrote to uh, some friends in, in Wisconsin um, in a, a town called Racine where I had read poetry in the schools. I used to do a one-man show called Poetry for People Who Hate Poetry. Oh, it was all living American writers, uh, Ferlinghetti, Corso, The Beats, and E.E. E. Cummings, who I really loved. And so everybody in town knew me, and the uh, editor of the paper published my letter to the editor and an editorial urging support uh, f to send food and clothing to me that I could give to the refugees. And three weeks later, two five-ton trucks pulled into the PSYOPs compound where I was working, and it was my mail, all little boxes addressed to me. So the colonel gave me autonomy. He said I could go anywhere in the country, work on any refugee project I thought worthwhile, as long as I took pictures. So for the next two years, because I kept extending, um, I had free film in developing. And I shot about 10,000 frames while I was in Vietnam. And it was everywhere from the DMZ and Hue after the Tet Offensive, 
uh, Full Metal Jacket was made yes. about way 89% of the, the city was destroyed in the Tet Offensive. And I was there working with refugees shortly after the communist troops had been kicked out. And uh, uh, all the way down to the Delta, to the island of the Coconut Monk. And that's something you probably wanted to talk about. Uh, it is. The, the Coconut Monk's Island was the most incredible place I've, I've ever seen. And I don't know if you can, let me see if we can get a, like a This is the that. Coconut this Monk. This is the Coconut Monk. And he was a four and a half foot tall hunchback who had an island of 6,000 pacifists who had dropped out of the North and South Vietnamese armies and a couple of thousand Taoists. And they prayed to Christ, Buddha, Muhammad, Lao Tse, Confucius, Sun Yat-sen, Victor Hugo, and Winston Churchill. And every three hours, day and night, each family on the island would send one representative to this big circular prayer platform to pray for peace. And they had two huge bell towers with six-ton bells, one over the other. And they were hit by tree trunks, and they would resound up and down the, the Mekong River for four or five miles, you know. <laughs> And we used to drop acid and lie underneath the bells. As you do. As one did. And uh, it was the only place in Vietnam I ever saw happy people. I met my first wife there, Cynthia Koppel, who was a war correspondent. And uh, I brought a lot of food and clothing down to the people on the island. And I, I photographed that place and everywhere else I went to Vietnam. So that was the start of my my photography. And then after the war, I got divorced in 73, and uh, so did my friend Tim Page. Tim Page was the most wounded Vietnam correspondent who survived. Tim was blown up four times. The last time he had the right third of his brain blown out the back of his head and survived that. He's still alive. He was the guy that Dennis Hopper played in Apocalypse Now. I've read that. And yes. he was my roommate for two years. In and Berkeley. he was the one who showed you, he further your education in photography. Yeah, he, he was trained by Larry Burroughs, the great Life magazine photographer from, from Korea and World War II. And um, everything I did in the camera in those days was manual. So I was constantly taught by Tim to change the light meter reading for whatever light was going on around me. And we did a lot of traveling together when I was doing my, my poetry show around the country. And uh, you know, we, we'd go through a, a, a canyon in, in Utah and it'd be very dark and then suddenly I'd, I'd burst into the light and uh, it was, uh, you know, an F-11 instead of an F-4. And um, this picture is, is a result of one of those things. We had just come out of a very dark area and I, I changed the F-stop to F-11 and suddenly the driver of the car jammed on his brakes at the last minute as this wild horse jumped in front of us and it ended up with this quite extraordinary picture. So that's pure luck, but it's only because I had just changed the light reading you know, on the camera. So um, I learned a lot from Tim and since then I've shot over 400,000 frames. I, I shot slides through 1993, or chromes as the kids call them these days. And from 93 to 2007, I shot prints, because that's when the kids were growing up, Katie and Devin. And then in 2007, rather reluctantly, I turned to uh, digital, and I've shot about a third of a million digital shots since then. The photo you just showed of that the wild horse, horse yeah. it, it, it's a little bit, in some ways, that's almost an example of your life, because I also read that your experimentation with double exposures was an, was an accident, and here again, this man knew everybody. Ron Kovic, I believe, left a roll of film. I'll tell you that story, yeah. Ron was a friend of mine in the uh, 70s, and I helped him write Born on the Fourth of July. I spent a year with him. We, I, I helped him sell the book in New York, and I helped him write, him write that book during the summer of 1975 in Mendocino and New York and L.A. <laughs> we were all over the country trying to get him to sit down for a few days and, and concentrate on the book. And he actually, in the midst of writing the book, in, in uh, April of 1975, went off with another friend of mine, Richard Boyle. Richard Boyle was the fellow that Oliver Stone made the movie Salvador about. Mm -hmm. James Woods plays yes. him. And he and my first wife worked for the same newspaper in Saigon. So Richard Boyle and uh, Ron Kovic decided to go to Saigon as it was being taken over by the Viet Cong. And then when that happened, they took a, a car to the Cambodian border so they could be in Phnom Penh when the Khmer Rouge took over Phnom Penh. 
And as Ron was driving to the border of Cambodia, he shot a roll of film. And after they got back to the States in the middle of May, I was still reading poetry in schools in the Midwest, and he joined me in Ohio. And somehow a roll of film that he shot in Cambodia had not been wound all the way back onto the roll. Mm -hmm. And it had a lip on the end of it. And it ended up in my camera bag. And I thought it was a fresh roll. So I just fed it through my camera again. And what happened was I shot a bunch of pictures in an antebellum mansion in Cincinnati, owned by the head of the Board of Education. Um, and he had these really gorgeous stained glass windows from the 1830s and 40s. So I did a whole roll of stained glass windows. And when I got it back, there were all these images from Cambodia overlapped with the stained glass. And there was really? one where there were two kind of like eyelid sha uh, shaped stained glass pieces. And through those pieces came the image of a refugee woman clutching a baby to her chest. And I looked at that and I said, my god, if I could figure out a way to do this on purpose, <laughs> this would be incredible. And so I, I, I'd done doubles before that, but not with the great avidity that, that was prompted by the Kovic pictures. And that, that was something, uh, as long as I shot film through 2007, that I, I, I did a lot of. Can we show a couple of the, uh, the double exposures? I think we've got some slides of them as well, Roger. Oh, so, good. Um, if we can bring some of those up. There's, there's one in particular with some flowers, with, uh, and there's one, I think that Is you're- Is this one? That's one of them, that's a great photo. Um, there's another photo of you, actually, that's like a sil. Okay, this is the one I was thinking of. Ah, uh, that's big, sir. In that's what I was thinking. In 78, I was hired by a couple of Hollywood screenwriters to uh, novelize two screenplays. And Mary, my wife, and I lived in uh, an A-frame cabin on a mountaintop in Big Sur looking straight down the canyon into the ocean without another house or light in sight. And uh, I would write every morning, and then the afternoon we'd pick a different part of Big Sur to explore every day. And that, that picture was a double exposure that came about at that time. Your work is getting a lot of attention very quickly. Now, how this happened was you had taken all these photos they were, and, and slides, and they were in your home. And we, we're going to talk about his home as well, because there's even more magic there. <laughs> but your, your daughter, Kate, was it? No, OK. You asked your son, Devin, first to digitize all the slides. Yeah. And there's another oh, one. That, uh, that, yes, that this I is actually is in, Mar in Marin County. With that the, is a beautiful the desert shot. roses of my wife, Mary. Um, yeah, in 2012, Devin Marley Steffens, my son, spent a year digitizing 40,000 slides that had been sitting in a closet gathering dust all these years. And the following year, Kate said, why don't I start an Instagram site? And I'm techno igno, and I said, what's Instagram? I don't even own a cell phone. Good for you. So she told me what it was, and she started putting up two pictures a day. And in October of, of 2014, we got discovered by Time Magazine, who did a story, and then uh, Slate, and then in, in uh, December of, of 14, The New Yorker asked me to take over their site for a week, and we put up 28 pictures. We gained 3,200 followers because of that exposure, that, that one week. And then the BBC World News did a television show on us that was seen all over the world. The New York Sunday Times style section <laughs> did a piece. The Guardian did a two-page Sunday magazine spread, uh, Liberation in Paris. I was part of Paris Photo at the Paramount Studios last year and got discovered by a gallery in New York and Chelsea, a very, very uh, big photo gallery called Ben Ruby, uh, uh, Linda McCartney's gallery. And they have signed me up now, and they're doing a major exhibition of my photos opening the first week in July in New York City. And uh, also in October of, of 14, a company in New York called Sun Publishers um, decided that they wanted to do a book of my photographs. And the book came out just in time for the art book fair in January of last year. And it sold out in, in about six months. Uh, and this is one of the only copies left. The, the family acid. So let's talk about this. There's so many good things here. I, I think oh, let me tell you about this. Yes. This is a good story. That's, that's made of alpha foil. And it was on the side alpha door. Alpha foil? Uh, you know, that, that kind of psychedelic uh, refracting. Uh, uh, like they used to take photos like spirits of Dr. Sardonica's kind of album covers and things in yeah, the 60s? Okay. Yeah. And uh, 
when I, when I moved to L.A. in 75, because I'm an actor, and I figured eventually I'm going to have to live here, so we came down <laughs> in 75, and I got to fulfill the great American dream two weeks after I moved to L.A. I got on a Monty Hall TV quiz show. It was called Three for the Money, and it was like Trivial Pursuit. And I played for a week, and I won $11,300, the new Buick, and $25 worth of dentine gum. That's brilliant. And Mary put this poetry, as she called it, on the cover. And uh, when they were looking through my pictures at Sun Publishers, they saw this door of the car with this on it. And the guy said, that would make a great cover. So that became the cover of The Family Asset. And the name of The Family Asset, I yes. should explain. Yes. Uh, when Katie was growing up, she said all her friends told her our family was like the Waltons on acid. <laughs> so she decided to call the website The Family Asset. Well, let's, let's talk about acid a little bit because... I believe I read the other day, you're, okay, you're 73. Yeah. And I think you tripped on your 72nd birthday, is 71st that right? birthday after 30 years. Um, so, uh, How was it? It was fine. Yeah, it was. <laughs> I'll tell you a story about that. <laughs> we, we dropped about 10.30, 11 o'clock in the morning. And I called Kate and I the said, The day is planned. Oh, yeah. I said, listen, um, stay by the phone, because your mother and I are going to drop today. You're welcome to join us. Oh, don't be ridiculous. So I said, just stay by the phone. So we dropped. And uh, in the middle of the trip, about 3, 4 in the afternoon, we decided to look at the psychedelic photos that I had taken. Mm -hmm. And at that point, there was a knock on the door, and it was our mailman. And he, he handed, I, I put my clothes back on, and I went upstairs, and I, I got the mail from him. And in the mail was a CD made by my friend Dr. Dredd, whose real name is Gary Himmelfarb. But Dr. Dredd was the founder of Ross Records the, uh, of course. In, in Washington, yes. the great reggae label. And uh, he had been talking for seven years about making an album called Theremin in Dub. So he used Ooh, the like dub that. tracks of a lot of his artists, like Israel Vibration yeah. and Culture, and he's the only person in history ever been allowed to remix a Bob, a Bob Dylan song, I and I, the one he did with Sly and Robbie. And he would overlay theremin. He had an original 1928 theremin. And this album was seven years in the works, and it arrived in the middle of our acid trip. So we're, That's we're, Providence. Oh, my God. It was one of the best trips I've ever had. So about 11 o'clock at night, I call Katie. And I say, Katie, we're at the sheriff's station. We've been busted. And she lets out this scream. <laughs> and I started to laugh. And Mary gets on the phone and she says, your dad's still tripping. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you can still trip in your 70s. Yeah, man. Here's living proof of it. So <laughs> don't be afraid. What would you tell people? Because... <laughs> Listen, um, <clears throat> the times that I've used acid was purely editorial in preparation for this show, which was still going to be many years away. <laughs> what would you tell people who haven't taken acid what acid is like? Oh, God, if I knew Or what the are they language. missing? What are they missing by having not taken acid? You're seeing acid? behind the veil. Yes. You're seeing the substance behind the substance. You're seeing the, well, let me tell you a story. Back in the, the early 60s, Henry Luce and Claire Booth Luce, uh, the playwright wife of the, uh, the founder of Time and Life magazines, were great fans of acid. And there were often issues of Life magazine devoted to LSD. And they decided that they were going to put out a special issue entirely about acid. And in order to uh, do some experiments, they brought about a dozen people to an apartment in New York, and they gave them the medicament. And um, they had two sets of people, pro-acid and anti-acid, no pun intended. Mm -hmm. And they said, you can pick out any picture you want from all the pictures that were taken that day to make your case that it's the most terrible thing on earth, you should never touch it, to, my God, I just saw God. Yeah. So there was only one picture that both sides wanted. And it was of a woman who had spilled some Coca-Cola on the floor, and she was down on all fours looking at the drop of Coca-Cola on the floor. And they both wanted it to make their case. Interesting. <laughs> well, the family acid is a great name, and I always thought that, that the name acid was a little bit unfortunate for the drug because 
it sounds a mu it sounds really scary. Acid sounds like you know it sounds something abrasive. And, your face uh, is going to melt. But yeah, then yeah, again, yeah. your face melted. Uh, yeah, and that is part of the <laughs> point. Anyway, all right. Well, anyways, yeah, we'll move along because another part of your life, one of the ways that you're most well known, you are potentially the greatest reggae historian of all time. You have written six books on reggae. And working on two more. Tell us where the name Ross Roja comes from. Bob Marley. I, I, got, I had just started a show on KCRW uh, in uh, October of 1979 with my partner Hank Holmes. And six weeks later, Island Records called us up and said, would you mind going on the road for two weeks with Bob Marley? <laughs> And uh, we did. That was the survival tour in uh, November of 79. And Bob didn't call me Roger. It was Roja. And, of course, Jah is Jehovah, yes. is Selassie, and uh, God. So Roja stuck, and I added the Ross. So Ross Roja is my name, thanks to Bob Marley. I've seen a lot in my time, and uh, this is the first person I've met that has a name given to them by Bob Marley. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Well, let's talk about this. Now, you've written six different books. Yeah. This has this... just been re-released. This was a hardcover 10 years ago, and they've just put it out again. Uh, Peter Simon, the great reggae photographer, mm -hmm. great photographer, Carly's brother, and I collaborated on this. And uh, it's a history of, of reggae music with a lot of artifacts from my archives, which now fills seven rooms of my home in uh, Echo Park. I used, to, I used to be a sales rep for a distributor, and we were talking about it earlier. I would go in tower stores um, all through Southern California, and this, this magazine was omnipresent, man. The Beat, you were a co-founder of this? Yeah, C.C. Smith and I started this as the playlist to the reggae beat, yes. and it just kept getting bigger and bigger, and it became the biggest reggae and world beat magazine going, and uh, Tower Records would buy 3,000 copies yeah. to distribute all over the world, so we were getting mail in Swahili and Japanese and Polish from around the world. And every year on the anniversary of Bob's passing on, on May 11th, we would, uh, I would edit an annual Bob Marley uh, issue. This, this uh, artist of the century issue was at the millennium, and I really believe that Bob Marley was the most important musical artist of the 20th century. That's not just my opinion. The New York Times at the millennium said that Bob Marley was the most influential musician of the second half of the 20th century. The first half was Louis Armstrong, and they were both daily herb smokers. Point taken. Go figure. Let me ask you this. A lot of gets made about the relationship of marijuana and reggae. And um, in, in the run-up to you coming on here, it's one of the first times that I've gotten questions from other people who worked here. And, and one of the questions had to do with, you know, the relationship of, of marijuana and reggae. Would reggae exist without marijuana? But I've got a twist on that. I have this theory. <laughs> no, no pun intended. I like this guy. Um, I have this theory that music of islanders emulates the lapping of water sometimes because I've noticed this whole Hawaiian music with Hawaiian slide guitar, Polynesian music, in reggae. I yeah, I get the pot thing, but I also hear this like. If you were to sit at the ocean, you hear water rock in a certain way. Is that just me? Or? It, it is, but it's also the rhythm of Jamaica. It, it's the sound that the, uh, the insects make at night. Uh, boom, boom, boom. But reggae's secret, Michael, is that it is the beat of the healthy human heart at rest. So even if you don't understand the lyrics, if you can't penetrate the patois, viscerally you're going to respond to that because it's what you heard way back in the womb. Boom, 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 boom. It just changes its tempo in its different manifestations, beginning with ska, you know, ska, 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 yes. ska. And then that transformed into rock steady from 66 to 68. Ba boom, boom, ba boom, boom, ba boom, boom. And then reggae came in in 68 with a chucka, chucka, chucka. So it's heartbeat music. And, and that's its secret. That's interesting. Um, your home, supposedly you have the most extensive collection of reggae memorabilia in the world. Well, the whalers have told me that, and they've been everywhere in the world, and they've met all their fans over the past 40 years, and they said that, so... They would know. It must be true. <laughs> I'm obsessive. <laughs> Everything I've ever found since 1973 
has gone into the collection immediately. I mean, I've always been a speaker and a writer my whole life. I was the New Jersey State Oratory Champion when I was a senior in high school. The Constitution, a barrier against tyranny. You have a <laughs> wonderful voice, and, it's, and it's served you very well. One of the other things that interests me about you that I wish that I had done, because I, you have maintained this collection of your photos, of the music that you purchase, the, 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 the clippings that you cut out. I guess for me, I've moved around quite a bit and I've jettisoned things at time to make that load lighter and I wish I'd kept it. How, it's just interesting that a person like yourself, you had the, you just kept everything. Yeah. Never threw anything away and thank God I was able to preserve it. I mean, there's 1,500 t-shirts. There's 2,000 huge posters. There's 30,000 flyers from all over the world. I got a poster recently from the Ivory Coast by a group called Negro Muffin. Jaw is Life is their new album. Um, there's statues. There, there's uh, Ukrainian nesting marlies. Uh, there's 4,000 buttons like this. This is a picture I took of Bob in 79 when I was traveling with him on the survival tour. And that's been bootlegged all over the world. Probably. Is that the thinker photo? Yeah, the Rasta thinker. Can we bring that up, the thinker photo? Because this is a fantastic photo that Roger took. Uh, they, we have so many photos, I'll have to look through it. Yeah. Um, this is my first trip to Jamaica. That's Big Youth, uh, second yes. from the right. And uh, that's in uh, June of 1976. You look like Robin Williams in that photo. It's funny because Robin and I were in the same improv class when, he, when we both first moved to L.A. in 75. This is crazy. Yeah. I mean, I, I, as you said, I'm an Irish Catholic kid from Brooklyn. And in a million years, I never could have laid out this. This, this is my most bootlegged picture. Somebody just sent me a T-shirt from Bangkok with this on it. Now, which tour was this? This was the survival tour. This is the one that you were on. last tour of California in 1979. And... Uh, in 2013, I spent two weeks on the road as the opening act for the Whalers on the survival revival tour, where I would come out and I would show pictures I took like this backstage in 79 on the original tour and tell Bob Marley's life story and the importance of the survival album. And then the band, the Whalers, would come out and play the whole survival album live. And I spent two, two months sleeping on the floor of a bus in January and February in Chicago. and. Boston and all, all the warm all the, spots. All the worst, worst places on earth in January and February. But uh, it was it was a fascinating tour. Listen, Bob Marley clearly one of the most important figures of the 20th century. As you mentioned, tell us something about Bob Marley that people most people don't know. He supported six thousand people a month with his charity. His, uh, really? his business manager, Colin Leslie, is one of my dearest friends. And he had to co-sign the checks or they weren't valid. So he knows how Bob Marley spent his money. And he had 6,000 people each month who depended on him for their very life. And the minute he died, his wife cut everybody off. Wow, OK. Um, Tell me he little... lived for other people. Yes. His, his whole purpose in life was to bring the message of Rastafari to the world, to help the sufferers in Jamaica. He was a, you know, that movie that was made a couple of years ago left out the most important rejection of his life. It was a movie about being rejected by the whites and the blacks. But they didn't deal with the most important rejection of his life. When he was five years of age, his father showed up out of nowhere and said to his mother, give me the kid, I'm going to take him to Kingston and educate him. And instead, he sent him to live with an old woman who was dying and abandoned him. And for almost the next two years, Bob Marley, from the ages of five to seven, was an abandoned child on the streets of Kingston, fending not only for himself, but this old lady. And you could have turned very bad very quickly in those circumstances, become a pickpocket or whatever. But what it did was give him an empathy for what he called the sufferers, people who were through no fault of their own, just an accident of birth, born into poverty. And it was his desire throughout his life to help those people. And he gave away almost everything. He never owned a house of his own. He probably bought three dozen houses for other people. He, he was just as happy sleeping on the ground with that rock stone for his pillow. Mm -hmm. That wasn't just a metaphor. Bob's songs were autobiographical, all of them. And, uh, he lived for other people. And he knew he was going to die young. In the summer of 1969, he was living with his mother in uh, Delaware, where she had married a man six years earlier. 
And that Woodstock summer, he told Ibis Pitts and Dion Wilson that he was going to die at 36. He was 24 at the time. It's an odd thing for a kid to be thinking about. It's very strange. But he did. He died at 36. He was psychic. He, he, he knew a lot about people's lives that he couldn't possibly have known through any normal way. Did I also read somewhere that one time you were sitting with Stevie Wonder yeah. and Bob Marley and also... No, no, just with Stevie after okay. Bob died. Out at the country club in Reseda. Yes. And there's a picture of us. He's holding... You know, Stevie always holds your hand when, when he talks to you. And uh, he said when he first met Bob in, in 74 and held his hand, he knew he was going to die young because he's psychic. Stevie. Yeah. <sighs> wow. Wow. I mean, I met a, last year I, I did a lecture on Bob at Florida International University, and uh, a Jamaican novelist came up afterwards, uh, and, and I had read about this guy, but he, he came up and he said, I've got to tell you a story. He says, I met Bob in 1975 at the University of the West Indies, and he came up to me. We'd never met before. And he sat down next to me, and he told me the most intimate details of my life that just flabbergasted me. I was left speechless. Nobody in the world knew these things. And Bob just spelled them out one after another to me. So we are dealing with a prophet, a real, honest-to-God living prophet in our time. That is exciting. Yeah, and I don't say that lightly. I mean, there's I, plenty of proof of this. I know, I know you, you, you say that. Um, because you have mentioned there are indigenous peoples. There's the Havasupai tribe in yeah. the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Yeah. Um, they believe that Bob Marley is the reincarnation of Chief Red Cloud, returned to Earth as a black man to lead the red man forward to his new freedom. <laughs> that's amazing. Where the did they get in, that? Well, that's the tradition. Just, uh, you know, they had a prophecy that there was going to be a black man coming, and when Bob came, they realized that was who they were talking about. The Maori people in New Zealand. It's yes. not Maori. I always thought it was a Maori. I did too. I got my hand slapped the minute I got off They're the like, plane. No boy. I want to meet some Maori. You're not going to meet any Maori here. They're Maori. It's like Marley without the L. Yes. And the Maoris gave Bob the title Redeemer when he came to New Zealand. The Aboriginal people to whom I've spoken in the outback in Australia believe that he is a deity. He, he, First Nation peoples, I love that phrase yes. that the Canadians use for, na for Indians, yes. First yes. Nations. They were here before any of us. First Nation people really revere Bob Marley because Bob Marley lived in, in communion with the, the rhythm of nature. He, if you asked Bob what he was, he said, I'm a farmer because that's what he was raised doing. And he understood that rhythm of life that the First Nations people understood. And he is a hero to First Nation peoples all over the world. This is, this is tremendous. I, I've been very excited reading this pack, past week about you and your work. And your knowledge of reggae is, is you are so astute. I'm, from what I understand, you are the most visited. Are, you have appeared at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame more than any other. Nine I was the first speaker there. And, I've done and I'm assuming this is shows. all regarding reggae. Uh, yeah. yeah, not just Bob. I've done Peter Tosh, I've done excerpts from my old cable TV show, the L.A. Reggae Show, and, uh, but they've all been uh, reggae-oriented talks, yeah, nine, nine times. Well, you have mentioned many times that, how much you love music. So when you, you leave Vietnam, you come back here, you speak out against the Vietnam War, which I totally get. Um, you live I, in, in Berkeley for a bit, I believe, then you go to Marrakesh, then you come back again? No, after the war, I spent a year lecturing against the war. And then in 71, I was so disgusted with the political situation that I, I moved to Marrakesh. I tried to get as far away from America as I could. And after a year living in the Medina, I discovered I was an American. So I, I came back. So as a result of that, that's when you discovered reggae. You read a story discovered in Rolling Stone. In the following year in 73. Because you were looking for something to feed your, your, yeah, your you, love of you music. Know, I, I am first generation rock. I, I saw all the great artists in, this, in the 50s. You know. My first rock and roll show was in Times Square and Alan Freed Christmas Jubilee in 70s, uh, 57. Uh, G uh, Fats Domino, Jerry Lee Lewis, Teenage Everly Brothers, and all these great doo-wop groups. And then the following summer, uh, Chuck Berry, Bo Diddley, Jackie Wilson. Jackie Wilson, one of the greatest performers of all time. 
And that was my love. And I loved the harmonies of doo-wop music. And then in the 60s, the folk era came in when the Paola scandal pretty well killed the first generation of rock and roll. And uh, then the folk music and Dylan came in, the consciousness came into the music. You used the word commitment. Commitment, absolutely. And there's a, um, there's a great difference between involvement and commitment. And it was told to me by um, an Indian Sikh whom I met in Saigon riding his bicycle around the world for peace. His name was Raghbir Singh, and he said, um, a chicken and a pig were talking about how they could help mankind. And the chicken said, I'll give him eggs, and you can give them ham. And the pig said, well, for you, that's involvement, but for me, that's commitment. It's <laughs> sure is. <laughs> wow. Um, but I digress, as I usually do. Well, that's OK. Um, Last thing on the reggae thing, because I want to get back to the art. I'm a huge Stones freak. Yeah. Keith Richards came to your house yeah. in Echo Park because you have such an astounding collection of memorabilia. Tell me about that. Oh, man. Well, I've been trying to get him to the reggae archives for about 30 years. We have so many friends in common. And, and he's lived in Jamaica on and off since 1972 when the Stones were making yeah. Goat's Head Soup. And um, he finally came, I guess it was about five years ago, with a six-person film crew from New York. Uh, they were working on the second volume of his Wingless Angels project. Yes. Uh, Wingless Angels involved uh, a great early reggae singer named Justin Hines, uh, who lived in, in Ocho Rios. And uh, they, these fishermen that he met on the beach used to come up to his house, and they would chant Nyabingi and play drums, and he would make recordings of it. But he wanted to do something even better than the first volume, which was in his living room, and take them to a little studio in a place called Steertown and record an album there. And he wanted to do a video about them. And so he came to my house to make a, a video and film the archives. And, and uh, I showed him a picture on my wall of this enormous stadium in, in uh, Milan. And it was Bob Marley's biggest show of his life. Uh, 110,000 people came to see him in San Siro Soccer Stadium. And I pointed the picture out to him. And he says, well, I suppose that's all well and good. In Rio, we drew two million. <laughs> A little tacky there, Keith. But Sorry, Keith. Yeah, I didn't mean to insult you, man. Yeah, that's, that's a little tacky. Uh, well, yeah. But it was one of the great days of my life to, to take him through the archives. And we even had a writer of what had to be in the house for him to I'm visit sure. us. Yeah. I won't go into all the details of that. Well, let's, um, <laughs> let's talk about the art a little bit more. You brought some prints. Now, mm. OK, so you've had numerous shows. You had one at the Standard in August, which was some of the photos that we've shown Probably, earlier yes. yeah. uh, that revolved around you know, California. And there's the Joan Didion kind of picture, which was quite yeah. cool. I think they used in the ad campaign. Can we bring up the picture with the, uh, the folks around the swim, swimming pool again? And So let me tell you who they are. On, okay. on the left is uh, Richard Boyle, uh, the fellow that Oliver Stone made uh, uh, the uh, the movie about, and uh, Salvador, and his girlfriend, and my first wife in the green bikini, and next to uh, her is a poet named Mark McCloskey, who was the first person to really introduce me to poetry uh, back in 1960 when I started college. He was a senior, I was a freshman, and he gave a talk called Catullus versus Gregory Corso, the ancient Roman versus the beatnik, and he read Marriage by Gregory Corso, which was one of the great poems of all time, and that just completely blew my mind. And uh, I've been doing that poem as part of my poetry for people who hate poetry show ever since. In fact, uh, on Valentine's Day, I did the 50th anniversary of my first performance of that show, 50th anniversary to the day of the first performance. And I, I opened with, with Marriage that Mark turned me on to. But people have referred to this as the Joan Didion picture. It was taken in Berkeley in 1972. And what's missing on the bottom are the toes of my two feet. <laughs> well, this photo was used in the ad campaign for your show at the Standard. That's right. And recently. And blown um, up huge behind the, uh, the place where the model sits yes. in the glass box. They blew it up to an enormous size, and she lay in front of it every day. So cool. Well, I was just recently turned on to you and your work, and you had you had a 
an appearance downtown at the library. Yep. And I guess you were doing kind of a lecture series on your work. And now this week, opening this Friday, yeah. you have a new show my at the first museum. first museum show ever. Oh, this is the first museum, museum show? Museum show I've so ever So previously had it was just gallery shows. Yeah. And, um, well, tell us about this show that opens on Friday. Well, uh, it's a program uh, that I put together with a neon artist named Brian Coleman, who I have known since 1973. He is one of the preeminent neon artists in the world and uh, has major pieces all over the world, from Japan to That's Prague. Him. This is this is Brian. Let's see, back in 1973, with one of his pieces. So you've known this gentleman quite a long, long time. Long time. And I, I used to take uh, long exposures of his neon, but about three years ago, he had an exhibition here in Los Angeles with some huge pieces, like eight feet tall, and I. I decided to try some experiments with time exposures, three and four second exposures of them, where I was literally dancing with light. My wife Mary says I looked like I have, a, have, have an epileptic fit when I'm taking the pictures. And what results are images like this. This is beautiful. Thank you. That's, that's one of my absolute favorites of the 2,500 I've shot This so one's far. called Dancing Light? This is Dancing with Light. Dancing with Light. And yeah, that's, that's the, the name title. of the show as well. Yeah, yeah it's the title slide. and. Uh, I, I plan to do a lot more with him as he puts up new displays. But we open on Friday night. The new Museum of Neon Art, which used to be downtown, has moved to a huge new location on Brand in Glendale, directly opposite the uh, Americana. And um, it opens uh, informally Friday night. And then April 1st, we have a, a big reception with a lot of neon artists and stuff. So. Probably that's that's the night to come see it. I well, I'm first. going to definitely try to come down and cool. see it. I, I mean, one of the great things about doing this show, I get to meet so many cool people that have lived great lives. And brother, you are a fellow traveler, man. It's like when I look at all the things that you've done and the people that you've met, I mean, you've got a picture of you with this hat on that used to belong to John Steinbeck because his son was your buddy. His son directed my TV show on Sunday afternoons in Vietnam reading poetry to the combat troops. <laughs> I mean, it's just remarkable. Yeah. Um, that was a 19th century this, French this, artilleryman's. Oh, that's it. And look at that righteous mustache my yeah. man's got. Oh, you know why? Because in the army, they said the regulation in the army was that you could not grow your mustache below the end of your lip. So I grew it above, and they couldn't make me take it off, and it <laughs> pissed off the lifers so much, and it just made me feel good. Oh, you smart ass. And, and every Sunday, you know, on television, I'd be reading poetry, without the beard, of course, but I had the mustache, and the Vietnamese all watched it, and they, they called me Om Rao, which meant Mr. Mustache. <laughs> I must say, I don't know which takes more nerve, going to Vietnam or, or, or parading around various countries reading poetry. I mean, that's, yeah. that, that, that's a... Poetry for people who hate poetry. I like that. Hey, there's one more photo. I know we got to get out of here pretty quick. There's one more photo I got to show is how you, you used to roll in the 80s. There's a, there's a photo of an automobile and a large tree. Can we find that and pull oh that gosh. up? My caddy. Yeah. Uh, well, well that's, that's in the campground in Marrakesh. There were two Dutch couples traveling. And, and when they opened the doors, it was a butterfly. And there's a, there's a rainbow, too. Now, this is how my man rolled in the 80s. Sequoia Garage, my yellow caddy, which had red and green pinstripes. We had the, uh, the roster colors on, on that caddy. That is fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, um, we're going to have to get out of here. Roger. Um, well, we barely scratched the surface. I know, I know. Um, this is the show at the Mona. Roger Steffens has been my guest. I mean, seriously, the man has lived three, four, five lifetimes, and I would really like to come to your house and You've see got your to. Reg reggae yeah, collection. Um, I was wondering before we get out of here, because you started out a poet, you are still a poet. Could you give me the fish <laughs> poetry <laughs> yeah. before we get out of here? This is a poem my wife Mary and I wrote in the Badlands of South Dakota. Where well, there's we were, a lot of fish, I'm sure. There's no water at all. <laughs> and so we were thinking about water and fish. So this is um, called There's Something Fishy with This Here poem. He was just a shrimp with crabs and a scalloped haircut, floundering on his soles and wearing a red snapper. As he was hard of herring, he lobster in a crowd and wrecked haddock on all of them. Kelp, kelp, call the carps. I see an enemy. When he sardine a moral, he oyster in and clammed up. 
They had a whale of a time, on purpose, till he spoke to her in a shark voice. My God, he bubbled. If we don't get some water soon, we're in for quite a trout. Isn't that a fish? No, that's a man. We wrote that for the halibut. Ladies and gentlemen, there's very little that can be said or done after that. Roger, thank you Except so much. Except shame on you. <laughs> that was fantastic. <laughs> thank you. You were the first person to recite poetry on antidote. Really? Yeah, absolutely. Oh. And uh, I, I'd so, rather learn from one bird how to sing than teach 10,000 stars how not to dance. That's E.E. E. Cummings. I wish I could remember what I had for breakfast. <laughs> it's, I, I'm astounded by you. This but, was really fun, Michael. I've got to tell you, this has been more fun than I think any interview I've ever done. Well, you're going to be coming back, and I'm going to come to your show on the 1st of April. 1st of April, yeah. It opens up this Friday, though, in Glendale, Museum of Neon Art. Roger Steffens is my guest. The book... The Family Acid, and uh, my boss turned me on to this, Michael Lustig, the founder of The Lip TV, turned me on to this, and it's been one of the grooviest weeks, man, just <laughs> learning about you, and I wonder if our paths had crossed in the past. Well, we I know, in, know in some record stores we've been there at yeah. the same time. I'm sure of that, because you worked in places that I frequented weekly. Thank you. This has been fun, you guys. My name is Michael Parker. This has been Antidote. I appreciate you watching. If you like what we're doing here and you like guests like Roger, man, let other people know. Share it with your friends and family. Leave us some comments. Just keep giving us good vibes. And uh, until next week, you, me, every single one of us. I and I. We are the Antidote. <laughs>